thank you for the introduction and thank you to the GCC PDI for hosting and organizing today's webinar. And welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for what I hope will be an engaging and, uh, and thought provoking session on the topic of ESG risk um, and investment to influence change. Um, before we get started, uh, I wanted first to briefly highlight why NASDAQ sees um, webinars such as this is so important what we do in this field. And I hope you'll indulge me with a brief look at a couple of slides. So overall, we see at NASDAQ good governance and effective boards uh, and the robust oversight of ESG matters as critical for the success of an international uh, stakeholder focused economy. And as part of our commitment to that, we set up the NASDAQ Governance Solutions and the NASDAQ Center for Board Excellence. And it's under the latter umbrella that I'm joining you today. Um, our governance solutions and services span class leading board management software, NASDAQ Board Vantage and Director's Desk, as you can see there, and board and compliance advisory services built around balancing technology solutions uh, and subject matter expertise. So those advisory services focus on delivery of board performance reviews and support with compliance related data gathering and reporting, as well as with onboarding and succession planning um, as other services, for example. So we can just go on to the next slide, just for a quick look at the Center for Board Excellence in a bit more detail. So the Center for Board Excellence is where we focus our efforts on community development, on thought leadership and partnerships with organizations such as the GCC, BDI, to build awareness, bring people together under a common goal, uh, and to ask pertinent questions, we feel. So please do scan the QR code, do feel free, and we'd be delighted for you to join, uh, join in with the conversation. So on to the main event. Um, so in leading um, board advisory for NASDAQ across Europe, the Middle East and Africa, my role is to plug into trends and opportunities, helping boards and their organizations to perform better and to understand their own effectiveness. Increasingly, that means talking about ESG, which is, uh, which as you might find today, um, can mean different things at different times, depending on your perspective, whether that's as a board member, a strategist, an investor, a legal professional, a risk professional, a government representative. So fittingly, we thought for today's session, we'd bring in some of those insights, those varying perspectives with our panelists, um, with a view to providing some practical food for thought as a, um, for as broad a range of roles and perspectives uh, as possible. So I'm delight uh, delighted to be joined for this session then um, by such esteemed leaders in this field as Karina Lifak and Rima Batia. Um, so Karina is currently serving as chair of the governing board for the Climate Governance Initiative, which she co-founded. She serves on the board of Italian oil and gas major ENI uh, SPA, uh, where she chairs the Sustainability and Scenarios Committee and serves on the Remuneration Committee. And she also serves on the board of the CFA Institute, where she chairs the ESG Working Group of the Investment Subcommittee and serves on the Governance Committee. Prior to that, uh, Karina had a 25-year career in finance, latterly running the governance and sustainable investment activities of uh, FNC Investments, the UK asset manager, which is now Columbia Threadneedle Investments. And also with Rima, Rima is the Group Economic Advisor at the Gulf International Bank, GIB, where her remit includes uh, providing insights on economic policy direction, financial markets performance, banking sector developments, and sustainability or ESG issues. A mandate spans advising the board, executive management and clients, and speaking at regional and global fora such as this. Uh, and Rima previously served as the group chief economist and the head of strategy at, C at GIB. So I'm sure you, um, uh, you, you all feel similarly with your know, positivity around the prospect of both Karina and Rima's different perspectives on this topic. I think you feel that's a, an enticing one, I hope you do. Yeah. So I suggest we jump straight into things. And just before we ask question, actually open up the debate, I think we have a poll that we want to share. So Noor, if you wouldn't mind, and bring that to the front. So we have three questions for the poll. Please do take a moment um, to, to answer each of those. So the first question is, do you feel your board is prepared for extreme disruptive events, such as pandemics, such as the COVID pandemic? Um, the second question, is ESG high on the board agenda, your boards? And third question, do you think your organization has the right ESG governance in place, notably to attract investors? 
So we'll just pause for a moment just while you answer those questions and we'll just ponder some of the responses, which we can then feed into the webinar. Let me know GCC BDI team when, when we think we're good to go. Aha, so we have our results. So thank you everyone for that. So the first question, do you feel your board is prepared for extreme disruptive events? such as the pandemics like the, the COVID pandemic? Yes, is the answer to that. I wonder if we had a follow-up question, whether it would be the case three years ago <laughs> and how much the lessons uh, learned have been embedded. Um, is ESG high on the board agenda? Yes, that's encouraging to hear. So over half of you feel that ESG is very much on the board's agenda. And do you think your organization has the right ESG governance in place to attract investors? No, nearly half of you with a response to that. And I think that's a really important differentiation to, to bring forward. Um, and maybe this leads very nicely into our first question. But I think we see, pers personally, we see with our uh, the boards that we work with that ESG is being discussed about, but the maturity actually around the practical tools and information, if you like, that's used to govern and oversee ESG effectively is where organizations are still delivering, still, still playing catch up, still implementing, still learning. And there isn't really a gold standard that's been put forward as a model yet in the, uh, um, uh, in the community. So Karina, Rima, what are your thoughts on, on the outputs from the poll? I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised. I expected, frankly, much more pessimistic numbers uh, on the first two. Uh, and the second one sort of fits with my expectations. It's, it's very challenging. And I think it's, you know, I think most boards really struggle with uh, their role in really positioning the company for ESG leadership, uh, at least to the standard that is expected increasingly by investors, especially investors in Europe and in the United States and Canada. And Australia, I should say also. Investors are, are quite demanding in Australia too. Yeah, I, I, so I agree with you, Karina. I think uh, I'm actually not surprised. I think COVID uh, did the trick. Unfortunately, we had to go, uh, you know, endure that suffering, and we still are. We're still in the midst of it, uh, but it certainly did open up the eyes uh, and recognition and the consciousness of the importance of this topic. And it's happening within the region, which is which is you know very very positive. So those numbers speak to that. And. I think part and parcel of this, the uh, trying to get our head around sustainability and ESG is the fact that it is such a complex topic. Um, there are so many challenges and you correctly mentioned, it's not just a GCC board problem. This is a worldwide board problem. And I think the numbers are, are, are quite accurate on that. So thinking more broadly um, about the scene that we have before us, if you like, with ESG and, and oversight of ESG particularly, what are the sustainability trends or themes that you each seek to engage with organizations on the most? Maybe start with you, Rima. Yeah, I, you know, obviously with, it, it, it's, it's clear, it's abundantly clear that this is not a nice to have kind of part of, 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 a, of a company strategy. Sustainability has to be embedded into the strategy, into the operations, into the decisions around capital allocation. and certainly a company purpose right at the top of that. So um, in my view, I think the most important part of, of engagement is really for organizations to do this deep dive into their ESG impact, into their environmental, economic, and, and social impact. Um, that really is the starting point. Um, the ESG metrics, I mean, they have to be embedded across every part of, of the organization's function. And only then, I think does that internal realization build as to the impact they're having. Um, you know, government policy, government direction is one thing, 
but the individual action um, when it comes to ESG is critical. That's a lot of introspection, a lot of, of looking inwards to see what are we doing, the, how are we producing, how our consumers are, are disposing of our products, how much energy are we using? I mean, all of those discussions, this materiality, as they call it, we have to see how material um, is our ESG uh, impact. So for me, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very passionate about that because sustainability is not just an imperative. Um, this is, it's critical, uh, it's, it's also an opportunity. So businesses, once they do this assessment can then also look at how many opportunities, which will be abundant, how many opportunities they have to grow and, and, and change to, to, to limit that footprint. And of course, that point of effectively embedding speaks very much to the last question on the poll there, which is going that, that next step beyond debating to turning it into something that's practicable and that's effective. Karina, what, what's your view on that? Um, adding to what Rima said, because I agree with everything, um, I would say an, one really important step um, to take, and it's a challenge in boardrooms, is there's a tendency to take as a given the nature of the business and therefore the business model, and then to work from there to minimize the bad and maximize the good and pursue opportunities and so forth. And I think if you take the example of one of the companies on whose board I serve, which is ENI, an oil and gas major, the first question we had to ask ourselves, and it was a very challenging one, joined the board in 2014 was, are we in the right business? Is this a business that has a long-term future? And if the answer to that question is no, then which route will we pursue? And in my industry, there are, I mean, in, in very simplistic terms, there are two. One is to coast uh, to uh, obsolescence and shutdown. And the other is to reinvent who we are and leverage the, the, the skills and the strengths that we have um, and the client relationships and, and the community and supplier relationships and so forth to provide an equivalent product that is not fossil based. And so in our case, that's the route that we have pursued. And it's not a route that suits everybody. And it's not a route that necessarily suits all investors. Um, so that's a pretty fundamental decision and fork in the road that companies need to kind of get across uh, before they then look at the operational footprint that they have. Mm. Um, so, you know, if, if and I think th that kind of question may be relevant in, or is certainly relevant in a number of sectors that are really at the sort of bleeding edge of, for example, the climate challenge. It may be a completely different conversation if you're in the software development business or the publishing business or, you know, um, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's really something that's very specific to the sector, but it's quite a fundamental um, reflection that boards need to have before they then embark on the execution of a sustainability strategy. And I think that's a really good example of where the board is, can and should be leading in this discussion with that strategic thought rather than a reactive or operational thought yep. first and foremost yep. around ESG. So yep. maybe sticking with you, if that's okay, Karina, how and where can boards have the biggest impact on sustainability related topics and or where do they encounter the most difficulty? Okay, maybe I'll start with the second question first, because, uh, you know, in my experience, the obstacles were very, very real. So the first is, I think, a cultural one, you know, because uh, typically, and there are ex exceptions, no doubt, but typically, you know, your, your average board director is a highly intelligent, highly experienced, highly successful individual who um, came up through the ranks um, at a time when sustainability was a very marginal, very niche issue. Um, and so uh, the two or three generations behind them, by which I mean generations as in a five or 10 year age range, uh, the culture is completely different. But, but people who are in boards now today, the majority of them don't have that worldview and mm. have to switch, have to learn. And in many cases, you know, these are people who are open to what's going on around them. They listen to their kids uh, who are often young adults. Um, they read the newspapers. They, they see Greta Thunberg out there who's, you know, um, hammering at, 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 at 
on them on a relentless basis. And so it's, they can't not see that the world is changing, but it, it's outside people's comfort zone. So I think that first challenge is to uh, accept that the world is changing and then accept that you know our role as directors therefore must change. And then, um, you know, from that, there's the kind of a technical exercise, which is to say, what business are we in? Is that, a, is that compatible with long-term sustainability? And more or less what I was referring to in my first answer. And then to your uh, first question, which is how can boards have the greatest impact? I think it's really there. It's, it's really determining that mission that Rima was referencing. You know, so do we want to rethink what our mission is and therefore, uh, so if you take, uh, again, in the oil and gas sector, in the past it was, you know, produce oil and gas using um, the best available technologies uh, with the minimal impact, uh, zero accidents, uh, et cetera, uh, respecting human rights and anti-corruption and so forth. Now, it's just to give you an example, it's deliver clean, sustainable and affordable energy to all who need it. It's a very different take on the, you know, the mission that we used to have. And, um, and I think, you know, so when you, you start from that and then you, as a board, you identify what those key deliverables are for the company. And then you have to step back and let management do it and then just provide that oversight challenge, but also the oxygen to make it happen. So the support for what could sometimes be quite, Mm, bold changes and the support for risk taking if in fact the business is going to have to transform itself. It's really interesting. Thank you. Rima, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, Karina, I think Karina covered it. So, but I think one thing that I just wanted to highlight, yes, uh, purpose is, is key um, and which is for, for the boards, um, you know, for them to have an impact, whether it's at the company level or at the at the industry or sector level. I think it's really important to understand that yes, we're talking about individual boards, but they also have to have an industry view because the influence, if one company is doing it right and the rest of them are not, then we're basically you know, losing the battle anyway. So it's critical that mm. we start thinking about boards um, within industries. I mean, for sustainability to work, the boards within industries also have to be part of a committee where these discussions are taking place. So the learnings and understandings are being shared. This is one of the biggest problems. This is this lack of uh, this knowledge sharing is not happening. So uh, say within the banking sector, one bank is sort of stellar in its, in its performance uh, uh, on, on a sustainability front while the rest of them are still struggling. Mm -hmm. So that's the one aspect of it. I, and I'm a big mm -hmm. believer something that has to happen because this will change, uh, at a, allow for change to happen at a faster pace. I think the other thing, which is another aspect of, of um, the purpose side, is that the financial impact of this bold, as, as Karina mentioned, these, these bold decisions that have to be taken, they're very hard to unpack. It's very hard for, for boards to uh, fathom um, whether these decisions are going to be in, in uh, reflect positively on company performance or not, they are also and boards are also answerable. Um, so if you if you think about it from a financial impact, I think it becomes a very hard and and tough road to take. Which is why this industry wide perspective, uh, thinking about uh, you know more boards within and within common industries uh, talking and and allowing for change to happen, chief executives doing the same. I think that that sort of builds up that momentum is uh, what, what we really need rather than just at the board level. And is that information inside sharing piece that you mentioned there, Rima, is that um, particularly common in the region, do you feel, or is that more of an international challenge? I don't, I think it's a challenge across the board. Um, I know that within, you know, within Europe, there is more exchange of information. There's a lot of research and that's shared. And, you know, there's a lot of thinking that goes on, but within the region, it's not happening. Within the region, it's very localized efforts um, within ac across industries. So some industries, whether they're in the consumer products, whether they're on the manufacturing side, oil and gas banks, um, uh, they construction, some of them have really taken the lead and are embracing 
all that needs to be done for them to start growing and, and ensuring that their businesses become sustainable. Um, but that's a handful. Um, so we need to have that, that, that bigger approach where this knowledge sharing happens, industries are brought together. And perhaps this is a public and private sector effort to ensure that happens, because I think that's where we'll start seeing real change. Mm. I, I think that is so true. And so much of what we try to to achieve in terms of change is dependent on things that are beyond our control. As you, as Rima said, Rima said earlier, no, we can't solve this acting alone. Um, we depend on on our our peers and competitors moving in that same direction. We depend on, like, if, if you take the oil industry, we depend on the auto industry, for example, also moving in that direction. As it happens, they're moving faster than we are. <laughs> We're playing catch up now. Um, we're, we're dependent on policymakers having the appropriate um, standards in place. So what you're starting to see are uh, companies coming together to demand more stringent standards, for example, higher blending rates of sustainable aviation fuel um, in with you know, conventional aviation fuel. So as to you know, power charge the growth of the biorefining uh, bio refining base, right? So it raises questions actually of potentially of anti-competitive behavior. And the European Union has opened up a review of where um, traditional antitrust uh, approaches, you know, law approaches to antitrust law, anti-competition law would make exceptions for um, promoting the public good and promoting sustainability uh, when companies come together to collectively drive the adoption of higher standards. Because in doing that, of course, they're, they're, they're creating conditions where companies that don't improve standards are at a competitive disadvantage, right? They're driving up standards, which, but it, but it's it considered that in light of the circumstances, in light of the ur urgency of, you know, achieving certain changes, this type of collective action should be encouraged rather than discouraged on anti-competition grounds. So I think the point that Rima raised is so crucial because we are going to bump up against this problem again and again and again, because these are systemic issues that none of us can solve without working with everybody else. That's very interesting, Karina and, and Rima. I think that's... Um... <laughs> Yeah, it's a fundamental challenge. And I think, you know, coming from particularly regulated industries um, or looking at examples from regulated industries in the past, when exchange of information tends to happen, it's when there's something solid to galvanize the group around and people actually kind of want to know what's going on, you know, a new piece of regulation or otherwise. I would hope, or maybe we will see, that as requirements and expectations become clearer and clearer and clearer from different stakeholders, the drive to kind of look over the shoulder and under Chatham House rules ask, others ask peers, you know, what those practices might be or what their thinking may be will be, you know, clearer and clearer or more and more evident. And thinking about current challenges that we have, um, so thinking about inflation, supply chain issues, cost of living issues that we're seeing uh, internationally, in your view, what is there that boards and their leadership teams can be doing differently to tackle those kind of disruptions? in the context of ESG? Um, I, you know, I, I think um, the challenge is, I mean, looking at supply chains, for example, within, within companies, looking at how um, the, the companies that we deal with, how are, they, how are they actually living up to the standards that we are trying to embrace? Um, it's a very difficult time for boards. It's a very difficult time for, for businesses and for managers who are trying to make these changes happen. Um, this collective action then goes back to, you know, how can boards come ensure that, that the companies are doing all they can to limit the impact of inflation, to limit the impact of, of the supply chain disruption. It's, it's, it's very difficult. I mean, in itself, sustainability is, is such a tough topic because of geopolitical issues, because of political differences. I mean, look what happened in the United States. Um, we had uh, Donald Trump as president. He decided that he's going to walk away from the Paris Agreement. Then we had Joe Biden come in and he said, no, no, we are going to embrace the Paris Agreement. What happens at the ne next election? What 
the problem with the with these kind of political issues is that it causes a disruption causes a, a, a sort of a, a break in the chain so we, you feel that you're making progress and then you go go and then you go like you know 10 steps back the pandemic was the same um you know we've we are seeing you know coal coming back up a lot of coal uh, production coming back online for the sheer fact that you know the communities are going to suffer without energy so yeah. i think for boards um and I, I think as i said it goes beyond the boards now this is this is at a, at a macro at a country level where it becomes a very problematic issue to deal with. Um, and the more uncertainty we see, which we are seeing in the current environment, um, you know, whether, whether it's interest rates being, being driven up, I think there's a greater consciousness that we cannot solve all these issues. And therefore, either we continue on the road, remain steadfast, knowing that the end goal is to build a more sustainable business and a more sustainable economy, or we succumb to these pressures. So I think the board plays a very important role in, in keeping everybody in the straight and narrow and not get distracted because the, the challenges, as I said, are, are tremendous. And does that pose challenges there, Rima, to where you, where you talk about you know, the coal energy example where boards and leadership teams are perhaps being prompted to abandon ambitions around ESG targets and goals to deal with the short-term issues? Is that a kind of a challenge overall to yeah, our ability to deliver on long-term aims? Right, because once once the E part of the, uh, of the, e, the environment part um, starts to uh, suffer, um, if, if you don't, uh, the environment part has to suffer, excuse me, so you can protect the S part, the social part. So I think then it becomes a question of looking at the ESG and saying, what part do I need to give way on in the short term? Where am I going to have the biggest pain? The social part is going to have, have a tremendous pain. So we will have to step back on the E, unfortunately. Um, but that just means that boards have to have uh, have to grow in this space and start having longer term plans rather than looking at it that um, you know, which is why I said this introspection is looking at what we are as a company, as a business, industry we function in, our purpose, uh, you know, which which Karina highlighted. It's so critical to understand our purpose because if we are going to move away and and have to sort of make some decisions which are which are not necessarily in line with sustainable practices, um, we need to ensure that that's a short term issue and we move back back uh, into line. That's the only way. I mean, in reality, um, there are many different ways to approach this, and there's a lot of debate around this. I know among the economists, there's it's it's back and forth, but the S part is suffering. So when you look at it, it's not an equal equation. So it becomes a, a very mm. difficult. This is where I'm going to respectfully disagree, <laughs> in the sense that. And it's interesting. I had this very challenge. I was in I was in Boston uh, last month, um, and I met with uh, one of our investors. And uh, it was interesting. Within that one investment institution, there were deeply conflicting views. So the investment managers on the fixed income and on the equity side were very, very engaged in this whole question of how are you going to set your transition targets, deliver on your transition targets? How are you coping with the headwinds that you're facing today because of the geopolitical crisis, the energy security crisis and so forth? And I walked them through, you know, our thinking and they were very, um, very supportive. And then when literally we were walking out to the elevator, and bumped into the chief economist who says to me, oh, you're one of those ESG people. Uh, yeah, you're gonna have to put this on pause for 10 years because it's just not gonna happen. And I said to him, you know, the time to have that conversation about putting things on pause for 10 years was 30 years ago. We don't have, <laughs> we don't have the luxury of putting it on pause for 10 years. And so, you know, when, when you're running a business that is effectively a super tanker, um, it's very lumbering to make a shift. You decide that you're going to make your shift and Putin's going to Putin and Xi Jinping's going to Xi Jinping. And there will be others that come after them who are going to throw spanners in the works on an ongoing basis. And our job is to 
see to it that the strategic direction that we have taken is the right one for the long term. Uh, I'm not saying that we don't make little minor adjustments here and there along the way. We might bump up some some refining capacity or or, or, or drill an extra well to or 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 actually as happened recently. Uh, make a m relatively minor investment to capture um, associated gas that was being reinjected in order to monetize it, ship it back to Europe. Great, those are small things, but fundamentally the ship is not changing direction. Fundamentally, our message to the market is we've committed to net zero by 2050. We've committed to, I forget what it is, minus 45% by 2030, you know, on a scopes one, two and three basis. That's not gonna change, it cannot change. Because if we start messing with it, we won't get there. <laughs> so, so we have to, and we have to because it's a matter of survival of the species and survival of our company. Um, and so we just have to take the, 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 the bumps in the road as they come and, and build resilience and build what we call optionality, you know, the ability to, in our case, we're actually accelerating the transition. We're, 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 we're pushing up, we're dialing up the pace at which we build and acquire renewables businesses, um, even as uh, we seize these opportunities, like I just mentioned, to grab some more gas here and there, because as Rima said, there's a big gap. Europe is, you know, losing a big, big chunk overnight of its gas supply, and we can't afford to have people freeze. So yes, there are these, but these are not long-term changes. The contracts that we're getting into are deliberately short-term. Uh, because we don't want to have stranded assets. We don't want to buy into assets that have a 40-year life on them anymore. We can't. We know that by 2030, this stuff is going to head south. I, I actually agree with you. I would, there's actually <laughs> opinion there. Um, I, I completely agree on that because I'm hugely committed to the concept. So the chief economist or economist that you met um, that that's where the disagreement would be. My yeah. view was that we would definitely have, I mean, we are being forced to deviate, uh, but those deviations should be, um, yes, we don't want to get into the concept of, of stranded assets. We don't want to um, make any changes that uh, materially take us off the journey, but mm -hmm. that journey is fixed in place and every effort, and I think that's that's a key part where where boards are part of companies which have to make these deviations, they have to ensure that oversight is said that this is a, a temporary deviation to manage mm -hmm. a temporary blip. Um, that's where the board plays a critical role. Yeah. Um, and then to ensure that we all get back on track because mm -hmm. um, you're, I, I mean, I'm a huge believer. There's no turning back. Mm -hmm. There's no turning back. So the alignment is very much on the potential requirement or acceptance of those short-term changes those short-term deviations in course, as long as you're still going in broadly the same direction yeah. that Neil's kind of showing that commitment, which comes back, of course, principles of good governance, understand purpose, understand mission, define strategy, and, uh, and, and stay the course. Thinking about things from a regional perspective, what are the biggest challenges in the region regarding a successful embedding of sustainable practices? Is it the short-term challenges that we're talking about at the moment where things could actually go off off course and maybe stay that way or is it um slightly more sophisticated going back to question three on the poll around how to actually embed good governance around sustainability so linkages to strategy or is it something more broadly about broader knowledge and and and, and education amongst different stakeholders Rima did you want to start on that um, yeah, so I think there's there's two sides to this uh, to this question. One, of course, is at at a broader fundamental level of sustainability and ESG. I mean, there's there's a gap in there's so many gaps. There's a gap between you know what needs to get done versus what is getting done. Um, there's a lack of consistency among the ESG data providers, reporting frameworks. Um, you know, there's there's so much. Um, you know, without standardization, it becomes exceptionally hard to move a concept forward. So ESG then falls falls into this. Everybody's trying, as, as you said, you know, everybody has a different view, different mindset. You know, what what constitutes sustainability is uh, partial acceptance for some, full acceptance for others. I mean, there's so much. So I think 
within all of that, and then you come to a region like the GCC, where we are dependent on hydrocarbons, and um, you know we need to reduce our dependency on hydrocarbons, but our economies, our livelihoods are tied to it. I think it becomes a very tough um, topic to navigate. But you know, um, maybe a few years ago, the GCC were were not necessarily very vocal about uh, you know their their commitments and and signing up to to their commitments. Uh, with regards to sustainability, but they have they have come to you know they've they've, they've grown in that space. They have now uh, signed up to charters. They are now uh, agreeing that they need to move forward in building their renewables and and and, and solar uh, capacities, renewable capacities. There's a lot of effort being done at the social level to ensure that you know the the the, the human resource is is looked after. There isn't um, you know there there the sides of poverty when it comes to uh, diversity, when all of this is showing up, we're seeing it within the governments with, with more and more female ministers um, uh, heading uh, portfolios, we're seeing it within the boards. So it's happening and it's happening um, across um, a variety of, of factors. And that's really, really positive. As I said, for the region, um, we need to have more discussion within, this, the, within the various industries. If you look at the economic framework, um, the, the growth of the region is still very much driven by government spending. And that government spending still uh, is uh, sourced from, from oil revenues. So that, that uh, linear connection, we need to start having, you know, sort of having um, changes to that linear connection. And these are happening. So in, in investments into the renewable capacity and solar capacity are one of the things. Um, we're seeing a lot of companies coming into the region, whether it's from, from Europe or from the US, they're coming to base here, consultants who are, who are engaging with, with the various companies here to try and get them to start embracing um, and embedding ESG into their business. So it's happening. And um, mm. I would say that it's been happening before the pandemic. The pandemic is now, of course, really put it into, into full gear. Vision 2030, uh, Saudi Arabia's uh, economic transformation program, I think sort of is leading the way in terms of uh, embedding ESG into the various aspects of, of economic development. We're seeing the same in the UAE. So these are the two sort of charging uh, and leading the region in, in that space. Karina, anything to add on that? Only a very little bit because Rima is far more the regional expert than I am. Um, but it's just I'll, I'll offer a, a perspective from outside the region on this one, which is that um, Rima, you mentioned that um, the, the, the economy is very much dominated by government spending and that government spending is very much fueled by oil revenues. Absolutely correct. Uh, it's also a fact that producers in the region believe, and I personally believe they are correct in this belief, that they will be the ones producing the last drop of oil because it is the cheapest, the easiest to extract, um, typically quite low uh, carbon intensi intensity. Uh, but if you talk to producers in um, the US, they're convinced that they're gonna be the ones producing the last drop of oil. Um, I'm from Canada. Uh, my Canadian colleagues in the oil sands business, which is just about the dirtiest oil you can find, are convinced that they will produce the last drop of oil. Why? Because our oil is free of human rights abuses and yes. our oil is free of geopolitical challenges. You can always trust us. We will always be there. We will be your reliable supplier. We won't shut off the gas the way some people do, right? So everyone has this idea in their head that they will be the last one. But at the end of the day, and if you look at independent analyses of exactly that question, it's the Middle East that is going to be the last one producing because its oil is the cheapest and the cleanest. All right. So that creates, to my mind, and I'm not an expert on the region, but if I were on a board in the region, I would find it challenging to drive, um, you know, a, a genuinely um, sustainability oriented strategy when part of the strategy is to hang on to what we have and produce it for as long as we can. Um, it's time limited. I mean, fundamentally, you don't want to be dependent on a, on a sunsetting industry. But, um, but it's very tempting to say, 
we're going to be the last ones, not you, not you, not. And, um, and, you know, so I applaud, I applaud the efforts that have already been undertaken in the region to diversify the economy. I think that's absolutely right. But there's going to be this tug of war between producers in the region and producers everywhere else, because <laughs> it's really this game of musical chairs where everyone thinks they're going to be on that last chair. Yeah, uh, I mean, to, I agree with you to only to some extent because the changes are actually happening um, even when you look at it from when, when you look at the statistics. So if you mm. look at the uh, statistics of the region, and I'm, now I'm talking at the macro level, mm. uh, you see that that shift is beginning to happen. The component of non-oil growth, as we call it, um, is, is growing and dynamic. But we have some challenges. The challenges are even that non-oil growth is related to oil growth. Mm. So if oil does not grow, then the non-oil sector suffers, which then goes back to this connection of the dependence on government spending. Yeah. The is that there's been a recognition, and I think that recognition sort of went to when shale came to the to the to the party and started becoming a spoiler to how high oil prices could go that became a recognition that the region has to change, it has to diversify, it has to move away from its dependence on oil. And that diversification strategy is real. It is happening. I mean, I, I think looking at the changes in Saudi Arabia alone, uh, the extent to which the, the, the sectors have been opened up, the extent to which the culture, society, uh, the non-oil part of that economy is changing, it is tremendous. The before and after is unrecognizable. So um, I think this is now only a matter of time uh, that we start seeing this change. The big game changer in this will be foreign investment. Mm -hmm. And in the world where you know there is there are limited opportunities for growth, the GCC offers tremendous opportunities for foreign investors looking to expand, to build, uh, to grow sectors which have been overshadowed by oil for so many years. So I actually see that, this, and this change is happening, we're seeing more and more of it, but the momentum still has to build. And that's where that shift will start happening because it'll become inevitable. And in your experience, Rima, how are investors using their, invest their investments to influence change in the region? So, um, you know, this is this is sort of the ideal time for sustainable development to to sort of gather pace in the region, because many of these sectors are either underdeveloped or are still in the process of growing. So, at a time when there's this greater consciousness of of ESG and and our and our commitment to sustainability, all the um, new projects are now being viewed through an ESG lens on so many fronts. It's not ubiquitous, so don't get me wrong. I mean, there's there, there's still a lot of work to be done, but it's happening. And the region, the GCC re region provides a huge opportunity for this because we have so much opportunity for growth and, and building these sectors that now we can actually start having the, the sustainable side of the equation starting to look a little bit more balanced if more investment is channeled. And that's where the governments play a, a big role. Ensure that these investments are coming in from foreign investors are channeled in such a way that the developments are um, increasingly um, uh, built on, on ESG uh, factors. Or so, I'm, I'm, so I'm conscious of time, given the schedule. I'd love to give you the last word on that, Karina, with your wonderful kind of background around sustainable investing um, to get your view on how investors are actually able to influence change from an ESG perspective. Well, so I, as you noted, I'm formerly an investor. And in fact, not only that, it's the investors that put me onto the board of the oil and gas company that I'm now on with a view to bringing a greater awareness on the part of board members of what investors are looking for. And so, you know, it's always a challenge because investors don't speak with one single voice on these questions. They are just as fragmented as the general public on this. And, but what you have seen in, in the sort of three steps forward, two steps back dance um, you know, of the last few years, um, until this geopolitical crisis, you saw an, an inexorable progression towards much more engagement. You saw Larry Fink of BlackRock and his over $8 trillion saying, 
climate change is the single greatest existential challenge facing, you know, the um, longevity or the resilience of our investments. I'm paraphrasing, I forget his exact words, but you saw, you know, voting uh, patterns, uh, you know, driven by the likes of, of BlackRock and others, um, you know, taking a much tougher stance on um, the re-election of directors, the support for shareholder resolutions on many of these topics. And then this year, there's been some backtracking. Um, so in the case of BlackRock, their votes in favor of environmental resolutions have literally halved. So where does that leave invest, um, is, you know, issuers like ourselves who have moved with the investors and are, are now seeing investors lose their nerve in some cases, not all, but certainly in the case of this one very big investor. Uh, again, we have to stay the course. I, I do think that fundamentally investors are becoming more demanding of us uh, as, as companies and as directors. And you're seeing one thing that, that, that BlackRock said and others have echoed is that, you know, they may not necessarily support uh, demands that they view as overly prescriptive regarding what companies should and shouldn't do to drive more sustainable practices. So for example, you know, some resolutions have urged that banks discontinue funding the fossil fuel industry. That's a very intrusive and prescriptive approach, right? So BlackRock and others have said, we're not supporting that. But what they have said is, we're not going to vote for directors, for the re-election of directors who fail to demonstrate a commitment to these issues. That's very powerful. If you look at what happened in the past year to some boards, uh, board directors who lost their seats, it's pretty clear that investors are watching. So the general trend is one of demonstrating to investors that we hear them, that we are um, setting like setting targets that are aligned with um, these these major existential drivers, and that we're backing that up with clear actions that 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 evidence that we will execute on these targets. These are not just theoretical numbers for 2050 when we'll all be dead. There is actually a robust plan and you can examine it. And in many cases, you can even vote on it uh, because you have these say on climate votes. So, um, so bottom line, even though it's a bumpy road, investors are becoming more demanding and more precise in their demands and more knowledgeable about what is greenwash and they want to see they want to see the real thing and if, if i'm add here um, i know we're short on time but it's really quick i think the infrastructure for for sustainable finance is actually now coming into place it's coming into place and without without that greasing of the wheels of, of money we're never going to make progress on this so that's uh, already happening the other big side is that we've seen this you know, ESG-related exchange-traded funds. I mean, we've seen an explosion of these funds. So the retail investor is now um, mm -hmm. also coming in and 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 as as Karina said, voting with their with their dollars or their money. Um, I mean, typically the retail investors are always are always the last to any party. So mm -hmm. I think there there has been a big shift and um, for the financial industry. I think we we carry a huge burden. Um, and we need to ensure that a we live up to our uh, to the expectations, and we provide the capital that's acquired to to meet those expectations. I think they're great notes to end on. Really thinking about not just the influence in terms of the action of investors, but actually the responsibility on all organisations' part to demonstrate to each other uh, that they're actually understanding the challenge here and how they're going to meet it. So thank you for, for those contributions both. I think that's been a very interesting and, uh, and lively debate. I'm glad there was a bit of difference of opinion there as well. I always like to see it. Um, Lucy, I think we have, uh, we have a few minutes left for some questions, if any are coming through. Okay, yeah, that's right. Um, so we have a few questions here and I'll read them out if that's all right. Um, how can boards be trusted on ESG when so few are qualified in sustainability? They're out of touch with the world and all the changes. Shouldn't marketing and sustainability teams take a lead on this? All right, let me jump in on that one because this has been, you know, my day job for the last uh, eight years because I agree, um, this is a skills gap. Um, the answer is not purely to just hand over to sustainability and marketing teams because um, they need a strong direction from the board. 
Um, I mean, I used when I was an investor, I used to see this very clear kind of divergence between the sustainability professionals in their companies who were very, very, you know, well versed in everything that needed to get done. But the board was nowhere on this and their access to the board was inadequate. Um, and so unless you have people on the board, they needn't necessarily be sustainability experts or practitioners. I mean, that's overkill, but they need to be open to it, committed to it. Uh, they need to be the ones who say, I wanna see the sustainability experts come in to see us in the boardroom. And I want to see how the principles that they are promoting in the company are incorporated into strategy into risk management, into human capital, into, you know, all of the key functions of the business. And I, I you know, one thing that, that any did, which I think is, is brilliant, and I think every company should do, is it set up an interdisciplinary team that brought together finance and strategy and m and and uh, um, HR um, and marketing and so forth, and sustainability, so that those, that expertise that the sustainability team possessed was really pushed through to all of these other functions, ultimately reporting into the CFO, up to the CEO and up to the board. And that's how you have integrated thinking. But you have to kind of force crackheads and get people together. And I think that can't come unless the board demands it. So in that sense, to answer your question, yes, we have a skills gap in boards. I set up the Climate Governance Initiative with the World Economic Forum to address that. And so we're working very hard to get more directors educated about these things. Uh, but just like, you know, not all directors are experts on digital, you know, uh, issues or cybercrime. It's still their job to see to it that the company is well positioned. And so they have to, they have to get to grips with this. In some cases of companies that are particularly exposed and the challenges are particularly complex, it might make sense to get you know, somebody with real technical expertise into the board, but beware, that's a trap sometimes because then the tendency for everybody else to say, ah, Jack is a sustainability expert or the climate expert, we'll let him speak up and then we'll do everything else. And that's completely dysfunctional. You really need to have effective chairing that says, all of us own this. All of us are resp responsible for this. Jack, what do you think? <laughs> you know, help us learn because we all need to become we all conversant in these issues. We all own it. We're all answerable for it. Yeah, and I, I think the other other side to that could also be that I mean, what we've done, for example, at GIB, we have a, a, a chief sustainability officer who integrates with all the different functions within within the within the bank, and also reports to the board on a regular basis and and keeps the board updated. So there's there's a lot. Um, you know that that knowledge gap, I think, is a work in progress um, for us, for example, at the bank. But it is being spearheaded by by a a person who's been given the mandate to ensure that uh, the entire bank is moving in that direction. And as you said, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion and a lot of head banging that goes on in order to achieve that. But eventually, um, the the purpose of, of 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 this person is also to ensure that the board gets um, updated on a regular basis, and also provides. Um, and we have been, we I mean, internally at the bank, we we you know we've been having a lot of sessions with with different experts. So the board members are also join and and get educated. Very much. Hundreds of times, so I'm just going to combine the next two questions, and I think these will be the last ones. Um, do you have to the panel any good case study examples of companies that are doing ESG well, and also which ESG KPIs do you think should be used? Can I take this and jump because my board meeting is starting in two minutes? Um, I think the answer is it, it depends on the nature of the business, but in businesses that are climate exposed, it climate has to be the, the, the dominant issue from which lots of other issues flow, by the way, human rights and corruption and biodiversity and water and um, you know human resources and safety and digital uh, excellence, they're all kind of interconnected. But there needs to be a very clear goal and a very clear pathway and, and very explicit targets that are tied to, well, for example, sustainability linked loans, um, so that, you know, 
we are incentivized as a company to minimize our borrowing costs it, by delivering on these objectives. It needs to be tied into remuneration so that we drive a cultural change across the organization and you know, individual executives are rewarded for doing, for behaving in a way that's aligned with delivering on that transformation strategy. So, you know, to me, that's, that's how you achieve it. It sounds simple when I say it, it's of course much more difficult to execute, but um, you know, that's, uh, that's one of, one of the things. I mean, Rima was very correct in saying that it's not the only issue and there are a lot of S issues and G issues that also need to be uh, looked at. But my personal view right now is that if we, if we fail on climate, we can pretty much tear up everything else because we won't be around. Um, so, so we really have to, we have to crack that. And I, I have to excuse myself because my board is starting, so apologies. And thank you so much, both of you. It's been really a terrific exchange. And thank you to the audience for the questions. Thanks, thank you so much, Karina, for your time. All right, as well. All right thank, thank you. you. I think we will, it's four o'clock now of UE time, so I think we will conclude now. I'm sorry we didn't get through all the questions, um, but from our side, GCBI, we just wanted to say a huge thank you um, to our panelists and moderator, James, Karina, and Rima. Um, I think it's been a really insightful discussion. We're incredibly grateful for you giving up your time and for all your thoughts. Um, and we say thank you to all the participants for attending as well. Uh, please do join us at our next session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, Rima. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.